Well, good morning. Well, good to see you all, and thank you for your invitation for us to travel the wild distance all the way from Sirencester uh, in Gloucestershire down to allegedly the sea. Allegedly. We looked out the bedroom window this morning, and there was the shale. And then there was what looked like, but we didn't test it out, mud. I'm sure it wasn't. It was sand, wasn't it? It's sand, yes. It's all right, I know Western super mud. Uh, and then in the distance, there was mist. And we didn't see the sea, but we hope we will do before we go back. But it's lovely. I love the sea. I'm a Devonian uh, by upbringing, so I love the sea. So it's good to come down and join you. But I love being in the presence of the people of God as well. Uh, Bryony and I, my wife Bryony, is uh, with me this morning, and we have been for the last 17 years um, wardens and chaplain at the Harn Hill Center of Christian Healing and uh, seeing God do exciting things there. We are going to be there for another six and a half weeks, and then we, we leave, and we go into what some call retirement. I don't think God knows what that word means. Uh, some spell it retirement with a Y, which is probably true. Our tread needs redoing uh, already for moving on. But uh, that's where we've been. And so for the last uh, 18, 17 years... And even in my ministry, because I'm an ordained Anglican minister, uh, even in my ministry in the parishes, uh, we've had been involved in the healing ministry all the way through. Ever since 1982, when on a mission to Middlesbrough, um, we uh, met the God who heals people. And that was quite a, a trauma in a sense, because I'd done the conservative evangelical journey, if I can put it like that. I'd done the bit where you, you're saved and uh, you come into a new life and everything else, and I'd done all that, and uh, I was on my way to uh, ordination, and suddenly I met Jesus, who healed Bryony very dramatically of a condition on that particular day, and suddenly the whole world changed, and the relationship changed, and suddenly I had more about God I had to explore. And so from that day on, we started looking at the healing ministry, what it was about, what God was involved uh, and how he wanted to be involved in his people. So through our ministry in the parishes and then for the last 17 years at Han Hill, uh, very specifically, of course, because it is a healing center, um, then we've been involved in the Christian healing ministry. If you want to know more about Han Hill, there are some brochures and programs out. I just happen to have them with me um, out in, in the uh, coffee area afterwards. Do grab them. They are free. It tells you a little bit more about what we get up to. Can I bring you a reading, first of all? Let's have a look at John's Gospel. If, you'd like, if you've got a Bible, then turn with me to John chapter 5. And let's have a read of that, and uh, then we'll continue with what I think the Lord may well be laying on our hearts this morning. John chapter 5, the first verse. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath, and so the Jews said to the man who'd been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again. Stop, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well exciting story. Uh, lovely to have Jesus walking amongst us, just uh, putting all the hospitals out of business. But interestingly enough, he didn't. Let me come back to that. Healing. 
healing and wholeness. The word healing raises all sorts of specters in people's minds. Maurice Cirillo and throw away your crutches. The experience that you have individually had and I have had at healing missions where I have seen the most appalling things done to damaged people in the name of Jesus. And I've watched horrible statements made. And uh, therefore, I have this little part of my brain that continues, even though I'm in the healing ministry, to have question marks the moment I see a place setting up for healing. What do they mean when they say that? And so the word healing carries enormous baggage. And sometimes we prefer to go for the word wholeness. It is interesting that David used the word shalom, which, of course, that Hebrew word for wholeness, being at peace with oneself, at peace with God, at peace with one's neighbor, and even at peace with one's environment, being at peace, that shalom peace that the Jews knew or should have known so well. Let me tell you three things about the healing ministry uh, that are believed and are not true. First of all, the healing ministry is a bolt-on additional extra for those who like that sort of thing. Many churches believe that. We've chosen not to go down the healing route, vicar. Usually, when I was a vicar, I was a bishop's advisor on healing at one time, and a lot of my colleagues would say to me, we've chosen not to do that. And I think, okay, well, that's fine, but I don't know how you've managed to separate it from the gospel. But there we are. The second thing is that healing means curing. Um, That uh, the moment you pray for somebody, you expect them to get up and walk out. And the third thing is that healing should become thereby the focus of everything that we do as a church. Now, those three things are false. Healing, if I go back to the first one, is not a bolt-on additional extra. It is part of the gospel imperative of Jesus. It's part of what we do as Christians, or maybe what we don't do as Christians. And I would guess that a heavy percentage of us have been involved with people and we've had a little prompt at the back of our mind that said, pray for them. And we haven't done it. Because we haven't known how to pray, we thought it was a bit stupid, and we thought we'd look foolish. But I would guess there's a heavy percentage of us who've been in an environment where the Spirit of God, I would say, has said to us, pray for that person. And we haven't felt equipped to do it. Because it's part of what we do in the same way that we share the gospel. And yes, there are gospel missions in the same way there are healing missions. But most of us share the gospel just by friendship contacts, by community contacts. And of course, you have your cafe. And so the gospel is shared in in insensitive and valid ways with people who are in a mess, in chaos. And so healing is part of that. Can I pray for you? And then, of course, the key is how do I pray? And that's part of a learning process because the healing healing ministry is a a learning area as much as anything else is. What do I pray for? How do I pray? What are the promises God has laid in Scripture? What do we mean by healing? It unpacks a whole range of discussion. And part of my role, I feel, this morning is really to stir you into talking about it and thinking about it. For this church in this community, what is God saying? The second thing that... uh, Healing means curing. And I don't know that's necessarily so. We we find in Scripture a number of people who were left with illness. Uh, Timothy was wisely advised to take a little wine for his stomach. Uh, Great wisdom there. You know, red wine's good for you. Uh, So I keep being told, we're not Methodists. No, no, we're all right. Um, But, you know, the, the idea, there were people who were left unwell in Scripture. Paul says, I think he left Trophimus ill. And so, uh, and Paul also prayed for healing. A lot of people come back to me and say, ah, well, Paul's thorn in the flesh. You can't ask for healing. And I would go back and say to them, actually, Paul expected to be healed, and so he prayed. And he prayed three times. And it wasn't until God said that my grace is sufficient for you, stop praying, that he stopped. There was an expectation in him God would do something. But in this case, he said, I'm not sorting that out. I'm leaving you with it. And there are times when God does, and I've talked to a lot of people, one or two in wheelchairs, who've said, if God healed me and moved me out of this wheelchair, I wouldn't have the ministry I have today. So 
God does use the situation we're in, but does he want to leave us in it? And that's always a question that we're forever asking. Um, the third thing, it becomes the focus of a ministry of a church. And I don't think that uh, healing should be the focus of ministry. People are the focus of the ministry of the gospel. Reaching out to people in their brokenness, in their damage, in their mess, in their chaos, because they're the people that Jesus meets with. He was never in the, the nice, uh, well, he was to start with, but he got flung out of the nice synagogues where all the nice people were. And he haired off down to where the sinners were and got criticized for it. He was where the broken people were. I was asked by a vicar once up in uh, uh, Gloucestershire to go and preach to his people uh, and tell them they were all sick. And so I took the passage, you know, I haven't come for the well, I've come for the sick. And I said, if you're not sick here this morning, then you might as well go home because Jesus didn't come for you. If you think you're well and you don't have an issue and you don't have any problems Jesus comes to minister to, then there's no point in hanging about because he didn't come for you. And I think there's a truth in that. If we're not aware of our brokenness, even as Christians, then there's, if we're not aware of what's going on, then how can we invite him to come and minister to us? Come and touch our lives and change us. I see you've got Harvest Supper coming up. Or Harvest coming up. I love Harvest. No, I don't. Never knew what to do with Harvest, really. Uh, despite living in a, in, a, in a rural community. What do you do with harvest? And I, on this particular occasion, as people came in, I handed seeds out. You can pinch this. It's not copyright. I handed seeds out to the parishioners as they came in. And they were, they, they, oh, thank you. Uh, and I said in the sermon, um, I'd like you to plant your seed and next year at harvest, bring the little pot back and we'll see who's got the tallest plant. I didn't know what the seeds were. I mean, I'm not a gardener. Um, and so when you come back, and they all smiled. They thought it was a great idea. And then I said, while you're out here, while we're measuring your plants, you can tell us how you have grown in the last 12 months as Christians. And you can say in your testimony how you were and how you are today, a year on in walking with Jesus. Uh, if they could have killed me at that moment, they would have done. There was no belief at all that there would be any difference between one year's end to the next. None at all. Now, God ministered to some of those people. I've got a, a teacher who said, um, oh, it's, uh, uh, I've got that cold again. What cold again? Oh, I always get it, every September. I said, do you want it every September? Well, it's the, the chalk. It was the days of chalk. Do you remember chalk? And it, it's normal. I said, do you want it? She said, no. I said, well, let's pray against it. So I prayed for her briefly. And it was a year later, in fact, it was 14 months later, she said, I haven't got that cold this year. And I said, well, no, of course you haven't. We dealt with that. And it was something as simple as that, that suddenly she was able to say, gosh, I've been healed. There's a dear lady of 80 that, uh, in our congregation called Olive, a uh, lovely lady, and she, she couldn't raise her arm. And somebody said, well, you, you, you pray for her. And so I, I, I prayed for her. And she said, uh, Paul's just prayed for me. She went around the congregation, Paul's just prayed for me. She said, um, and I can't raise my arm. Oh, she said. You know, this is, this is the touch of God. But then she still died. Not then. <laughs> she waited a few years. But, you know, we are on a journey to the end of life. We are getting older. And as we get older... And then bits of us start getting a bit faulty. So therefore, when we talk about the healing ministry, when do we swap from looking for somebody's healing in physical terms and start preparing them for death? Which is the journey we all have to do. So do you see what I mean when it's, it's, not, the, it's not a bolt-on additional extra? It's not, um, uh, it's not the uh, uh, curing of every ill that's around. It's not the focus of everything we do. It is part of the gospel message. And if I just can spend a few minutes looking at this passage, then perhaps we can see a little bit of what we mean. Because I, I see Jesus here almost walking into your cafe, if I can put it like that. Because when we look at the story, Jesus is going up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Um, there, were, there were three feasts that the men had to turn up to, or should turn up to once a year. 
uh, and he was on his way to one of them. He was heading towards Jerusalem. He had no vision for an evangelistic mission. He wasn't on a healing mission. He was just on a journey. He was going somewhere. It was as simple as that. He got up that morning, checked his smartphone, and discovered it was a feast, and therefore he was on his way. It was as simple as that. The second thing we're told, which seems, until you know the story, totally relevant, was where he was passing. And that's the second verse. In uh, Bethesda, uh, this place which is surrounded by five covered colonnades, and this is where the disabled people gathered, a bit like a hospital. And there was, of course, a rumor around at the time that once, every now and again, the angel would stir the pool. Could have been quite natural, could have been real, who knows. Um, but the pool got stirred, the first one in got healed. And obviously, some, something had happened for that story to, de- uh, to develop. And so, John shares that story with us. And uh, as we're reading that for the first time, we wonder why we're told that. You know, what's that got to do with Jesus on his way to Jerusalem? It's just a fact of life. And so I can say that you get up tomorrow morning and uh, you're heading off into work and uh, you think you'll pop in for a cup of coffee uh, because there happens to be this coffee bar. The two things seem to be totally unrelated. But as Jesus is walking past, verse uh, verse 5, one was there who'd been an invalid for 38 years and when Jesus saw him, and that is a crux moment, When Jesus saw him. Now, Jesus never did anything that his father didn't tell him to do. Jesus never said anything his father didn't tell him to say. And he even said it, he claims, uh, in the way the father wanted it said, which is a bit irritating that we don't have audio version of the scripture said by Jesus. Because then we'd have heard how he said it as well. And I think we'd be quite surprised at how he said some of the things he said. But when Jesus saw him, now what was it at that moment? A little voice in Jesus' head where the Father through the Spirit said to him, I want you to minister to that man. That's the one for you today. And that's where the challenge for us comes in because whatever our ministry may be, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, there is always the danger for Spirit-filled Christians, for the Spirit of God to suddenly say, That's the one I want you to minister to today. Well, you look really excited about that. But that is the danger of walking as a spirit-filled member of the Christian community. That we are there as Christ figures in our community to minister on behalf of the kingdom. We are ambassadors of the kingdom, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians. Ambassadors of the kingdom. It's always good if you're having a conversation with somebody. You know how conversations go. Invariably, you'll get to what you do for a living because it's how people assess us. We can put them in boxes when we know what they do for a living. We can sort out who they are. So it's one of the key questions. What do you do for a living? Be excited one day. Do something different. Say to them, I'm an ambassador for a kingdom. Is that more important than being a postman or a manager or or whatever else it is we might do? You know, where are the priorities? I'm an ambassador for a kingdom. And they will invariably say, what kingdom? And you you can spin it out for as long as you like, really. But effectively, the kingdom of Jesus. Now, that's either going to be a conversation opener or a conversation killer. But it's then how we develop it as we allow the Spirit of God to move in the given situation. How do we develop that? But this is what we are. We're ambassadors. And so we're always available to the Spirit of God who manifests himself through us that that Jesus might touch the lives of those around us. And so here's the Father saying to Jesus, that's the guy. And so Jesus goes over to him because he never disobeyed. You know how we... We, we get a little prompt of the Spirit, perhaps, and we now analyze it, we pray about it, we set out fleeces, and uh, we do all these things because ultimately we don't want to do it. It sounds far too risky. Gideon puts out fleeces hoping it's not going to work because it all sounds far too risky. 
And we're a bit like that. Jesus responded. You know, Paul said uh, that we should, be, we should be learning to will and to act according to Father's good pleasure. Jesus was there because he was sinless. He knew. And so when Father spoke, Jesus acted. And so when Jesus saw him and learned that he'd been there in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Now, it's interesting, the words well and cured in this, uh, in this version are all the same word. They're a medical term. It's a medical term. It means sound in um, wind and limb, fit, cured. But interestingly enough, it is a medical, physical term. It doesn't have the spirituality of being whole. So there is a lack in this man still, even though he is physically made well. But let's, let's go to this question. Do you want to get well? Well, that may not be the question that we introduce ourselves to somebody. It may be as we've listened to a story, as we've heard a little bit about somebody's uh, journey and their pain and their anguish and so forth, that we say, can I pray for you? Interesting lady we prayed with, we were at a, a church... Um, uh, up in Warwickshire, yes, in Warwick yesterday, and a lady came forward for prayer. Who's, she had three children uh, who'd been in prison. One was still there, and you saw the anguish. Now it's easy to sit back and look at people sent to prison and think serves them right. But we saw the mum and the pain of the mother who watched three of her children in prison. And so what we prayed about, yeah, was the the lads in prison that Jesus would meet them. We prayed about the mother's pain. And we brought mum's pain to Jesus because I know he would want to be in the midst of that with her, walking with her, supporting her, enabling her, encouraging her to have hope for her sons even though they're traveling this path at the present time. And we prayed about this dear lady's pain. Can we pray for you? Because it's so easy to pray for the three sons. Jesus, will you come and meet them and open their eyes, bring life to them, hope to them? set them free from their, their uh, criminal ways and activities, everything else. And in front of you, you've got a broken mum whose mother's heart is in agony as she watches what her children are doing. We forget that. And we don't pray for her and her pain and bring her pain to Jesus. And so Jesus says to this man, do you want to get well? And then you've got to assess the answer because this guy doesn't say yes or no. It's, not, it's far too simple for that. Um, I, I can't fulfill the requirements of the rumor that's doing the rounds. You know? Um, and people have got all sorts of answers. Well, I've tried, in fact, we were sitting at breakfast this morning. I thought, thought it was absolutely fascinating. Um, the two guys who we were sitting alongside at breakfast, and one of them was obviously not very well. Um, not that I had a particular prompt to pray for him, but, um, but, but he was sitting there at breakfast, and he was not very well. I think he was inhaling. Is that what he was doing? He sounded as though he was inhaling, had a... Uh, a chest uh, problem of some sort. And he said, oh, get up. He said, but the thing that sorts it out is I do my Tai Chi. That's what I do. I get into my Tai Chi positions. And I'm listening to this thinking, you know, this is the guy I get. This is, how, this is his answer. You know, the guy in the pool here is saying, I, I've got nobody to help me get into the pool. The chap we were sitting alongside this morning was saying, I, I just need to get into my Tai Chi position." Because everybody's, everybody's got a way that they deal with the journey they're making. They have to, to cope. And for us to be able to say, well, can we bring Jesus into this? Can we just offer this up to Jesus and let him minister in whatever he wants to do? And so Jesus uh, listens to what he's saying and ignores it in a sense. I'm not interested in the rumors. I'm not interested in all that. Father has set his heart on you today. Which raises all sorts of more questions about healing, doesn't it? What about the other 50 people, 60 people, 80 people who were always there? One of the key questions of the healing ministry, why do some get healed and some don't get healed? Part of the kingdom journey that we make. How do we cope with that? How do we work with that? How many of my colleagues in the healing ministry have died through illnesses when they've prayed for those same illnesses in other people and seen healing? Why does it happen? No idea. Just remember the key factor that God is sovereign. And I trust him. And so Jesus says, get up, pick up your mat at Walker. Once the man was cured. And Jesus does have this wonderful touch. And we do see the miracles occasionally. We've seen a few at Hanhill, Not loads of them. I'd love to see more. 
we have seen the occasional immediate healing uh, because God does that from time to time. But for many Christians, he actually expects us to be on a journey of wholeness and therefore to be looking at ourselves, looking at who we are in Christ, looking at who we are. It's fascinating listening to your software this morning. Uh, and particularly just the little bit you left us with, which was, is it in the uh, creation of the program? Is it in the download of the program? Or is it in the way we're using the program? And that had so many echoes for me this morning because we hear truth of God, we distort it with our own experience, and then we, we use it in a faulty way. And so God says, uh, I'm the healer, we hear, God heals everybody, it's in the atonement. And we go out and say, you're not healed because you haven't got enough faith. You know, one of the classic problems that we have, and I'm just fascinated by that this morning. I do wonder whether you're, you're a soft touch. Um, but we won't follow that one through. But do you see what I mean in the brokenness that we are? And here is Jesus ministering immediately, but for many of us we have to make a wholeness journey. And so we're left with a man who had no idea who Jesus was, but Jesus had healed him. Had no idea of his spiritual dimension, no idea of the Savior of the world, no idea that if Jesus came into his life, it would be transformed. Hadn't the foggiest who this man was. All he knew was he'd been told to do something, he'd done it, and he got into trouble. It's as simple as that. And I find that exciting as well because it means that people do not have to sign up to the Christian gospel before Jesus touches their lives. None of these were Christians, by the way. There weren't any Christians. So therefore, part of the evangelistic mission is to be able to pray for people. Dave White, an old mate of mine I was at Theological College with, who's a vicar up in, um, oh, I think it's St. Andrew's Chorley Wood now, um, used to go around Liverpool praying through people's letterboxes because they'd never opened the door. And he'd pray for the sick through the letterbox. Is there anybody in there sick? And they'd say, well, Auntie Flo. And he'd pray for Auntie Flo through the letterbox, clear off. And he said he never got millions of people, but there was a steady trickle of people who saw people healed through that prayer who would suddenly turn up at church next Sunday. Uh, I used to be in sales years ago, and I remember my sales manager saying to me, the more cold calls you make, the more danger there is of getting an order. And I've translated that into the more people you pray for, the more danger there is of them being healed. The more people you share the gospel with, the more danger there is of them actually meeting Jesus. In other words, it's not our job to fix things. It's not our job to see the answers. It's our job to be the ambassadors and then see what God does and see what Jesus does. Which leaves us, I hope, <laughs> with a whole raft of questions, and rightly so, because the kingdom is about exploration, discovery. What does Scripture say? How do we respond to that? But that didn't work for me. So therefore, is it true? Lots and lots of questions. Why do some get healed, some don't? This man got healed, but it seems he was missing the spiritual imperative. He didn't know who Jesus was. That was another stage of his journey, if he ever made it. I don't know. It means that people can come in here not knowing who Jesus is. We can still pray for them because Jesus knows who they are, which is far more important because he can start touching their lives. And that's the call that's laid on our lives. And that's where healing and wholeness fits into it. Not that it becomes the be-all and end-all of life, but it's just part of a lifestyle. Can I pray for you? Can I lift off the shock and trauma of that? Can I break the hold of that lie over your life? Can I actually tell you that God forgives you when you're sorry for something? And he sets you free. And can I lift off the guilt? Can I lift off the shame? Can I lift off the sense of failure that is upon you today? And say to you that God loves you. And he fights for you. And he has fought for you. And he's gone through the cross for you. It's an exciting journey, but it's a hairy one. Because it challenges us at our own personal belief systems of, but it's only me. You've been called to the healing ministry, Paul. Well, actually, we all have. 
We all have. Matthew 28 and 20 is quite a painful passage because it says not only baptize them all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which I'm sure you do, but it also goes on to say, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Part of the command of Jesus to the 12 and to the 70 and ultimately down up to us is heal the sick, preach the gospel, teach, heal, cast out demons, raise the dead. It hasn't stopped. It rolls on still. Now, I might have stirred up all sorts of stuff, and that's good, and, and uh, we're going to run away and leave you to get on with it. But what, um, what Brian and I are very happy to do, and I think you've got some people in your own congregation, if there's something that's hit you personally that you'd actually like to pray about, then Brian and I are both very happy to pray with you, and I know David said there are some in your congregation who would happily pray with you as well. So if you've been stirred by what I've said personally, or you even want to... Uh, ask God to give you the courage and the grace to get out and do what I've suggested, we're very happy to pray with you. We will be around. We're not running away quite that fast. Um, but, uh, but it is an exciting journey. I can promise you that. And when we leave Harn Hill, we aren't stopping because we then have to put into practice what God has laid upon us and taught us through the years. And at one level, we look forward to it. Another level, it sounds a bit frightening. But I'm sure he's got it all in hand. Father, I thank you that you have laid these things upon us, and um, thank you too that you've given us of your Spirit to enable us to do what we're called to do. For the world lays on us so many things that get in, get in the way, uh, that our, our whole status in society, what people think of us, um, what if we get it wrong and make mistakes, what if it doesn't work, a whole load of questions come piling down. Uh, and so, Lord, they're all valid, and they all need to be recognized and, uh, and worked through. But, Father, will you stir your spirit in us? Will you give us the grace to spot when your spirit is asking us to do something and to recognize either our obedience or our disobedience and start to see the reality of what the kingdom is doing in us and what the spirit is calling us to do and to be? And, Lord, will you stir an excitement in us in that? Stir a real joy in our hearts. And may we, a bit like Adrian Plass in one of his stories, uh, when he, no, it was John Wimber when he comes away from the first person who is healed by his ministry, who walks away as though he's used to doing this all his life and gets back into his car and says, hey, I've got one. Lord, may we have that same sort of enthusiasm and passion as we see you touching lives and changing lives, gently, graciously, but uh, determinedly. And so we give you the glory, because this is your ministry, it's not ours. It's your ministry, and we honor you and thank you for it, in Jesus' name. Amen.